Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of JPNN. It is Friday, May the 20th. Somewhere, somehow, 20 days have occurred in May. I don't understand why or how, but hey, it's okay. We'll figure it out. Another week is gone. We've got some news. We've got some earnings. Blizzard's finding itself once again in a potential lawsuit. Let's get to it. We'll start with that news of Blizzard. It's not for sexual harassment or anything, though, which I guess is good news, question mark. Uh, they're, they're facing a potential uh, class action lawsuit over Hearthstone packs. According to court documents, Nathan Harris, who is a native of Arizona, and his lawyers have filed a proposed class action lawsuit in California in early May on behalf of his child suggesting that Hearthstone's card pack system deceives players, particularly minors, into making a non-refundable purchase. In the complaint, Harris's lawyer says that the miner spent more than $300 playing Hearthstone from 2019 to 2021 using her father's linked credit cards and debit cards without permission. The lawyer argues that the miner didn't know the odds of getting good cards and didn't know she couldn't get a refund. Apparently, she, quote, almost never received any valuable cards, end quote, according to the lawsuit. Harris's lawyer suggests minors have the right to disaffirm contracts, i.e. get out of them or get a refund under California Family Code. The complaint also takes issue with Blizzard Entertainment not disclosing odds for these packs as well as a failure to implement, quote, parental control features and the right for minors and their parents to get a refund. Harris and his lawyer are also asking the court to award the class action status, meaning it could include any minors who have uh, ever purchased a Hearthstone card pack with real money. That'd be, quote, hundreds, if not thousands of people, according to the complaint. Blizzard has responded by asking the court to move the case to the United States District Court in the Central District of California, which the company claims is the appropriate jurisdiction. As recently as March, the company successfully won a court ruling to move a lawsuit over Overwatch's loot box into arbitration, according to Bloomberg. Blizzard argued that the miner in that case had agreed to this via the game's user agreements. Yeah, I mean, it like, yeah, the user agreements, you know, that thing that you skip and just automatically agree to, they're there for this very reason. Uh, you hit accept. Either you as the parent hit accept or you as the kid hit accept. And I think that's pretty much going to protect Blizzard in most cases here. It also seems a little... Uh, Mr. Harris seems to maybe be trying to get a little bit uh, out of this. I, I don't know. Going to court over $300. I'm all for making sure that, uh, you know, kids can't get into an app and spend a shit ton of money. But maybe that starts with the parents. I don't know. Longer conversation, not one that we're going to have here. But we'll see what comes from this, if anything. Moving forward. Take-Two and Zynga will be merging on May 23rd in one of the game's industry's biggest ever deals. The stockholders of each organization approved all proposals related to the combination of the companies on Thursday. Also on Thursday, Take-Two CEO Strauss Zelnick, most evil, well, one of the evil names, a lot of evil names in the CEO world, really big evilness. Uh, he came out and said, quote, we believe our combination with Zynga will be transformative for our company as we create a powerful and diverse portfolio of industry-leading titles, which also uh, is becoming a leader in mobile games. Oh, sorry, while also becoming a leader in mobile games. I knew that sounded weird. Uh, Zynga CEO Frank Gibbo, again, evil. He says, quote, we're excited to take, uh, we're excited to one step closer, Jesus. We're excited to be one step closer to combining Zynga's free-to-play expertise and the next generation of mobile platform with Take-Two's best-in-class capabilities and renowned intellectual properties. 
So basically both sealers are like, yay, we're getting paid. We're excited for, to be paid. Yay. That'll go through on May 23rd. Uh, the first of many big deals. I am assuming that we'll see over the next uh, nine or, or 12 months. Ubisoft had a financial call. The CFO, Frederick Duguay, uh, answered a question about Ubisoft's blockchain efforts. With the firm recently announcing that it was no longer making content for Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon Breakpoint, including its controversial NFTs. When asked about what Ubisoft has learned from the experience and whether or not it was going to pursue further blockchain initiatives, Duguay punted on the question. Came out and said, quote, as we've been saying, we've been investing in a number of future techs, including cloud computing, voxel, and Web3. And that's part of the DNA file of the company to learn, iterate, and explore before expanding. And we believe these different key technologies will allow us to deliver very meaningful value proposi propositions for our players with deeper social experiences and allow players to express themselves in different manners. Dodge that one there, buddy. <clears throat> you dodge that one. They're going to continue doing it as long as there's potential money to be made. But yeah, the Embracer group put out a financial report and it's got a lot of information in it. Some of that information Gearbox is currently working on nine. Yes, I said nine triple A games. Quote, Gearbox continues to scale the organization to deliver on its ambitious growth plan. And there are currently nine triple A games under development. Man, that is... That's a lot of stuff coming out from uh, from Gearbox. On the uh, status of Elix 2, it says it did not quote, it did not live up to management's financial expectations in the quarter, but developer Piranha Bytes is expected to provide quote, a positive ROI over time. So they're hoping that the long game of Elix 2 will, uh, you know, come to fruition for the company. I don't think it's going. Uh, they also said that uh, The Evil Dead, the game, has sold 500,000 copies in just a few days. That's the second game this week to do that. Well, really the first. The second one we'll talk about a little bit later in the news. They also said Saber Interactive is now working together with Asper to work on the upcoming Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic remake. Uh, Asper has gone, into full, has gone full in to make this the best game they can make. When we acquired Asper... We knew from the start that they would require assistance and Saber has tremendous expertise in creating these types of products. We're fully confident that the game is going to be fantastic, but it's a massive, massive product and massive products require a lot of effort and a lot of time to make good. And especially when you're talking about a game uh, already old, very old, we're basically uh, had to remake the game from scratch. Hmm. More news about the game in the next several months. I bet you will see something next month on that. Saints Row reboot from Deep Silver is, quote, expected to step change the pace of organic growth. What the fuck does that mean? To step change the pace of organic growth. What? I don't even know what that means. Does that mean it's going to, like, make money over the course of time through MTX, I guess? That's some marketing bullshit right there. That's a weird one. I don't know what that means. <laughs> uh, they ended the report stating, quote, after the end of the quarter, we further strengthened our development capabilities and IP portfolio by entering into an agreement to acquire Crystal Dynamics, Eidos Montreal, and Square Enix Montreal, including Tomb Raider, Deus Ex Thief, and Legacy of Kane, and other IPs. Are we going to see finally more Legacy of Kane with them actually naming that? I mean, they straight up named that IP. Whew. Whew. That's good. That's good. I'm all for, uh, you know, more Legacy of Kane. V Rising kind of hits that note a little bit. Uh, the announcement got an overwhelming and positive response. We see a great potential not only in sequels, remakes, remasters, and spinoffs. A lot of news out of that uh, financial report. A little bit of a related story. During the financial call, Saber Interactive CEO Matthew Karch, evil, was asked about the launch of Evil Dead the Game. The host of the presentation bringing up the game's review scores when he says, 
quote, aren't fantastic, but for the genre are quite solid. Coach notes that the Sabre team is, quote, pleasantly surprised by the scores to date, which have uh, exceeded the team's internal targets. The other thing we've learned is that the days of Metacritic score determining how well a game sells are long gone. Games these days are sold by social media, by influencers, and by buzz. Games are sold by the quality of the product itself, irrespective of how well the game performs. I can name games that scored eight and nines that I can tell you publishers wish they never released. It's nice to put a plaque on your wall, but if you can't afford the nail to hang the plaque, what's the point, right? Wow, that's a phrase right there. If you can't, aff it's nice to put a plaque on your wall, but if you can't afford the nail, what's the point? That's like a CEO idiom right there. <clears throat> it's true. I mean, it's true. Moving on. Bungie is uh, going to be adding another layer of monetization in Destiny 2's upcoming summer event. They said, quote, while the event card and event challenges rewards are free for all players, acquiring these extra cosmetic rewards will require players to purchase the upgraded event card. Upgrading the event card will cost a thousand silver and immediately grants players an exotic reward bundle. I see. It's like a season pass in a within a season pass kind of. I'm just going to click on this thread real quick and uh, see how the Destiny subreddit is responding. Ah! Okay, they're very pissed. They're very upset. Uh, they're not. Uh, yeah, they're. Yeah. Hmm. Pretty upset about that one. Moving on. The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt has some news about its next gen versions. Uh, those, of course, have been delayed and have been uh, moved to in house development, have been scheduled for release in Q4 later this year. They tweeted, let's make this seventh anniversary even better shall we? We're delighted to share the next-gen version of The Witcher 3. Wild Hunt is planned to release in Q4 2022. See you on the path, Witchers. Weird. That'll probably sell still well. You know, it's fine. It's fine. Frogwares, which is the studio behind the latest Sherlock Holmes games, announced that they are currently working on a new horror mystery game called, uh, codenamed pa Paleocentia? Paleon Paleontia Paleontia P A L I A N Y T S I A Paleontia Let's go with that. Part of the announcements reads as follows. We can officially now reveal that working on a new game codenamed Paleontia. It's a horror and mystery uh experience that fans of both The Sinking City and Sherlock Holmes should like. We'll make a proper announcement uh soon but for now we have a fairly uh a few what the fuck is this a few early oh few early concept pieces to share with you sorry the the text is a little bit jumbled to be fake to be frank paleoscience is not the project we had originally planned i'm just going to keep slurring it eventually it'll get to the right place plan on doing next but the invasion forced oh but the invasion forced us to reevaluate Man, I was like, what? What in? Okay, I get it now. They're in Ukraine. They forced us to reevaluate everything. Uh, it's a bit more streamlined than our latest open world titles, but it's a game we are sure we can deliver under the extreme under these extreme circumstances. We will be revealing more about our next title shortly, and if you are interested, we'd like to give you more detailed look into our lives and our work during a war. Perhaps it might bring you a little bit, a uh, little bit closer to us. We're also looking at other ways to bring the game to you directly. More info on that soon. We'll see you at uh, Summer Game Fest. Tachia, Tachaya, Takia. It's that Breath of the Wild game. It's like Tropical Island. Announced back in September 2021. Scheduled for a spring 2022 release has been delayed to early 2023. They released a statement and says, quote, we are overwhelmed by how far this project, inspired by a tiny island we call home, has brought us. After three years of passion and hard work, we owe it to everyone and ourselves who has been supportive to deliver the best game we possibly can. To that end, we have decided to move our release window to early 2023. 
This extra time will allow us to really polish every aspect of the game and flesh out all the little details that we know will make Tachia a really special experience. Thank you again for your support. We have a lot of exciting things to show on the road to launch, so stay tuned. All right. In an FAQ update for the Lord of the Rings Golem, the game is targeting a fall 2022 release. That's right. Remember the game, The Golem or Lord of the Rings Golem? Yeah, that's still coming out. Fall 2022. We'll see what happens. Probably see that at Summer Game Fest too. V Rising, I mentioned a second game that has sold 500,000 this week. V Rising, past that. They tweeted it out earlier today, said, quote, it's official, 500,000 vampires out there have stepped foot into Vardoran. I didn't realize this area was called Vardoran. Thank you all for joining us on this journey. It's good. Speaking of Summer Game Fest, we've got two more additions to that little three, four day period happening in early June. The PC gaming show will be happening on uh, June 12th at 12 30 p.m pacific the show will feature over 45 games according to pc gamer some of the titles that appear in the show will be arma 4 sam barlow's immortality a mod project for half-life alex levitation warhammer 40k space marine 2 and victoria 3. does it say if uh our buddy day nine is going to be hosting um uh... Uh, returning host day nine and uh, Mika Burton. There you go. We'll see him there. We'll see him there. The other show is the Future Game Show, which is set for Saturday, June 11th at 12 p.m. PSD, 3 p.m. EDT, or of course, 8 p.m. Bullshit Time. Uh, it'll have around, quote, 40 titles as well. We'll see what happens at all of that. We'll be watching all of that, most likely with drop frames, if not solo. Square Enix has filed some trademarks in Japan for the three titles, Final Fantasy VII Remake Intergrade, Labyrinth Striker, and Final Bar Line. These went down on May 12th in Japan. They were made public today. In music, the Final Bar Line is the last bar line in a composition, so it's possible the Final Bar Line trademark is for the subtitle of a new rhythm game. The other two, who could say? One of them is probably mobile. We'll see what the other one is. Remember Babylon's? Wait, is this? Yeah, Babylon's Fall. Remember that game? They've announced a season two roadmap. It'll feature a new chapter, a new weapon, a new element, 80 new quests, including skirmishes, sieges, and duels, and new cosmetics. Babylon's Fall. How many players Babylon's Fall got on? Let's. I'm clear. How many players Babylon's Fall on Steam? Last 30 days, the peak players was 132. The 24 hour peak is 33. If you're looking for something to play this week and you don't want to spend any money, Borderlands 3, by the way, is currently free on the Epic Game Store. If you're looking for some fun shooty times, grab some friends and go grab it. It's free. Uh, Siphon Filter will include trophies when it's released on the new PlayStation Plus, by the way, if any uh, Siphon Filter fans are out there. Six games are coming to Stadia as part of the OG Unwrapped Showcase from the Outright Games team. Remember Stadia? They are the DC League of Super Pets, My Little Pony, Paw Patrol Grand Prix, LOL Surprise BB's Born, J Star Trek Prodigy Supernova. I don't think the J is supposed to be there. And DreamWorks Dragons Legends of the Nine Realms. What the hell is... Okay. Remind me, we should check out a trailer for LOL Surprise BB's Born. Let's see what that game is during trailer time. Let's subject ourselves to that. A little bit more uh, random news for the day. Red Bull is funding tournaments for Age of Empire 2 and Age of Empires 4 with an Age of Empire 1 side event for $550,000. 
You can find more information over at redbull.com for that. They're calling it the Wololo Legacy Announcement. Nice. Uh, interesting news here. Norman Reedus. You know, the guy with the fetus, Norman Reedus, did an interview. And apparently, a Death Stranding sequel is in the works. The specific interview question was, quote, Okay, so you got the book going on. You've got the final season coming out and the spinoff, and you're filming Death Stranding, the video game. Norman answered, we just started the second one. And, he, and the interviewer said, how did that come about? And Norman said, Guillermo del Toro, who gave me my first movie, called me up and said, hey, there's a guy named Hideo Kojima. He's going to call you. Just say yes. And I go, what do you mean? Just say yes. He goes, stop being an asshole. Just say yes. He said he was in San Diego and Hideo came with a big group of people. He's from Tokyo and he showed me what he's working on, a game called Silent Hill. I was blown away by what he was showing me, and I was like, yes, let's do this. It's not Miss Pac-Man. It's so realistic. It's so futuristic. It's so complicated and beautiful, and I was completely blown away. It took me maybe two or three years to finish all the mocap sessions and everything. It takes a lot of work. Then the game came out. It just won all these awards, and it was a huge thing, so we started part two of that. So Norman Reedus, the man with the fetus, can confirm it's not Miss Pac-Man. What is... Maybe we'll see that at Game Fest summer. Like, maybe weird. Weird. Another weird thing to come out, at least from a marketing perspective, uh, God of War Ragnarok had some accessibility features uh, revealed this past week. Some of those are subtitles and captions being improved. Text and icon sizes. There's controller remapping, high contrast mode, audio cues, and more. You can head over to blog.playstation.com to find the full list of the accessibility features that were revealed. Final bit of news here, the original version of Sonic the Hedgehog from the Sonic the Hedgehog, sorry, the, the original version of Sonic from the Sonic the Hedgehog movie, the ugly Sonic, made a cameo appearance in the new Disney Plus film, Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers. In the new Disney Plus movie, Ugly Sonic has his own guest book, a guest booth at a comic convention. And is trying to make the most of his infamy by selling signed photos of himself. Talking about the convention goers, Ugly Sonic says, quote, they'll like me for who I am, not like the last time when the, uh, not like last time when the internet got one look at my human teeth and burned the place down. <laughs> what the fuck? Is that movie, is that show out? I didn't realize that movie was out. That's wild. Huh. I might have to watch that movie. It's on Disney Plus streaming today. Wild. Here's an image for it if you guys want to see what it looks like. I'm going to be very tiny in this image, but that's okay. <laughs> that's pretty cool. I actually like that. That might be pretty funny. We'll have to check that out. Anyways, that's going to do it. Maybe you could check that out this weekend while you're playing Borderlands 3. I suggest V Rising. It's very, uh, very addictive, and I'm enjoying that. That's what we're going to jump into on stream if you want to catch the VODs. That'll do it for JPNN today. Make sure to check us out Monday for more news, and we'll see you for trailer time on Tuesdays and Thursdays as well. Feel free to drop a comment, a like, an upvote, uh, whatever, you know, interaction especially all those bots. Shout out to all those bots that I've been uh, deleting from the comment section. You guys are great. Really pumping those numbers up. All right. We'll see you Monday for more. Have a great weekend. We're out of here. Bye-bye.